it's just a talk and like an, it's like a niche talk what I'm going to tell is not quite useful for you but maybe you can learn something at least the approach or the way I uh, attacked the problem maybe it's useful for you for other kind of problems so I'm Pepe Vila I come more uh, web security background I started working with uh, some years ago I started working with microarchitecture and I got into this whole let's say so some things about what I want to say with reversing CPUs or well, why do we need this the idea, more or less, is that the assembler x86 is a very low level, and in practically speaking, it is. Actually, it's not like that. So x86 is defined by a specification part of the ISA, says what it needs to do, all the instruction, and that's a specification which is quite stable, and during, uh, over the years, it has been maintained to continue executing things that were used before. Some extensions are added, but the idea is to have a, a stable layer and be able to work without changing things too much. But people are demanding more performance, so how do you keep something stable and you make it faster every day? How do you make new generation CPUs faster and more efficient? The response, the answer, is the implementation of this architecture. So here is where we enter into microarchitecture. That's the uh, stru uh, stru uh, structure of a modern CPU, x86 microarchitecture. We have uh, assembler instruction. They go through this pipeline. They will be executed. So here we have a lot of uh, optimizations of predictors, buffers, caches, many histories, many stories that will try to block the code and squeeze uh, uh, as much as possible the CPU. This is not documented. We don't have. We have a, a slight idea of what everything does, but this is just a scheme. It's not detail. And what component? What does component? Each component do? It's particularly known. Lately, uh, people have started looking at it, and everything they looked, they just broke it. We have a spectrum. We have meltdown. We have data sampling reliabilities, so which are uh, here in those buffers, in those log buffers, with the predictors. They injected from a. Influence all the process through predictors. They did weird things, actually. So I'm going to focus today in a part of modern CPU, which is the the cache replacement policies. Why do I say this? I don't know if anyone remem remembers all the just uh, last year's talks. I presented uh, an algorithm to find addiction checks, which are just addresses that are mapped in the same cache in an efficient way. And this is useful because we use Ericsson sets for these uh, microarchitectural attacks. One thing I kept, I didn't put this uh, slide in last year's um, presentation. If I play my algorithm in different assembles of the cache, I have some assembles, some sets, in which uh, the green thing is a success rate. But in the rest, uh, it works awfully. So in practice, I added some heuristic backtracking. I fixed uh, the success rate almost to 100%, but uh, in the cost, uh, but the bad tracking was uh, much lower. But I, I, I was crazy about these numbers. It's a weird pattern. So looking around, the response was the replacement policy. Not all the sets of the cache implemented the same uh, policies. And depending on the replacement policies, my algorithm worked better or worse. So basically, that's what motivation to see to set. Let's see what happens here, because they are not documented, and it's the the third generation of i cores. We don't know which replacements uh, policies uh, have these uh, CPUs, so I try to see if I'm able to obtain that. So I'm going to go briefly on that background of of caches. Those are the numbers that come from the laptop that you have here. It's i core from eighth generation. Generation. We have a cache hierarchy, the smallest one, which is close to the core. And then we have the biggest one, which is shared, which is a bit slower. And that's it. As I usually say, for good or for bad, caches are something transparent for the programmer. The only effect that we can observe is the latency. When you access uh, an access, if the access time is, is fast, you can de deduce 
you're touching level one cache. If you're if you take a longer, it's level two, and if it's longer, it's level three, and otherwise it's uh, RAM memory. If we make a zoom into it, we're going to make it simpler. We just have one uh, level of cache. We have one CPU on one side. We have the DRAM memory, and from the cache expected, it is uh, cache is divided in divided in blocks of 64 Ks bytes. Excuse me. So the cache is divided in sub sets. In this case, I just put two, but there are several more, and each set is associated, uh, have lines in this case. In this case, I have a cache with, with sets of associated four. Each, uh, each set can have four blocks of memory. So when the CPU wants to access an address, what it does is going to discard the, the first six, uh, first part, we have uh, the first six, we, we, with that we will refer each byte in each block and we're going to use the, the following 10 bits and 10 bits in this case it's because we made the calculation on how many sets there are 124 so we need 10 bits to index uh, a, a specific cache set in this case this specific access tells that that address should be in set one we when we identify the set the hardware will compare the tags of all the stored blocks in this set with the tag that we are requesting and the tag is just the, the higher the heaviest ta uh, bits here we can happen we can find two things uh, there's a match so there's a tag matches what we're looking for so that's a hit and we'll move to the block to the CPU and the latency will be loaded then that's great the other thing that can happen is that we had to do the same thing but uh, we have a fail uh, a cache miss in this case, we will need to ask to the DRAM the block, and what will happen in the cache is that the replacement policy will decide which block we destroy to make place for the new block. And the idea is that if we, we request that block again, it will be in the cache. In that case, it will be much, uh, it, it will take more time to access. So this organization of caches has a reason so the, the blo partition blocks and is is a equilibrium between the fast the easy to use in hardware and what we exploit the spe spatial locality of edge program and this uh, replacement policy tries to exploit a uh, temporal locality of programs you want to maximize the number of access that you can find in the cache so what's the look of those uh, replacement policies the 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 classic ones are the FIFO, the first one that enters is the one, is the first one we destroy, or uh, LRU, which is the last, the, 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 the one we used the last time is the last one that we will kill. So the idea, the general idea of all these is that what happened, apart from having the tag and the block, uh, the data block in the line of the cache, we will ha add some uh, metadata that will allow us to count the age or the frequency in which to which this uh, block was accessed. This uh, replacement policy will be those metadata, those control bits to establish uh, the logic. Basically, uh, now current policies are more complex than the ones that I mentioned, but keep the same idea. Have some metadata and count something and tell something. So if we zoom in, we focus in a specific set, there's a way to see this, uh, this set and see it like as a a milli machine. It's just an automata, and we will define uh, some entry habits, like uh, memory blocks. Because instead of uh, of saying uh, address, we just put some letters or identifiers, and an output alphabet. That that's the only uh, observation that we can add to the cache: a hit or a miss. So here we have a state a status. We have A or B. If we have access. A, we can get a hit, and we follow in the same state. If we access B, there's another state. But if we access C, it will make a miss, and there will be a transition. This new state, instead of A, B, it has C and B. So C has replaced A. If we look at this more into detail, we would see very quickly that this automata corresponds to a uh, associativity to cache, that means uh, capacity for two blocks, and that increases, uh, implement, excuse me, that implements FIFO policy. It's only when there's a cache failure. Each state that we are seeing here has on one hand the content, but also those metadata. AB is not the same as BA, BA, because B enters first and in the other one, 
A entered first. So, this is background. What are we going to do? Reversing this uh, replacement policy, as I said, even if it's uh, if it seems not relevant, there are some people that thought this was relevant and tried to extract extract that. So I'm going to mention it quickly. Jerick uh, approaches said that uh, I'm going to implement this later. I'm going to implement um, a certain um, replacement policy and implement some benchmarks and compare that to the hardware. If the radios, then the hits were were the same we can infer that what was simulated is similar to what we had in the hardware. So for a general idea, that's fine. But it's but it's not scalable and it's not guaranteed. Another more systematic uh, approach is the one proposed by Avili Reineke, which is uh, it's very usual when we're uh, facing a new problem. If we if learning po uh, replacement policy is very complex, maybe we could restrict the client the kind of policies that we want to learn. So they said, okay, well, let's define a sub process, a subset of, of, of policies, which are we call them permutation based uh, policies, which includes FIFO, LRU, and we'll try to learn which of them is implemented by the hardware. So they proposed an efficient algorithm; they can run it on hardware, and besides, it it shows. If the, if the algorithm finishes, it's correct. If our hardware implements this permutation policy of all these subsets all um, among these um, representation policies, that's fine. But current hardware uh, uses more complex things, so this won't be valid. What this Guillermo Rueda's work, it's like continuation. It's a, a master's degree final work. And how I'm going to generalize this learning about uh, permutation policies to any deterministic policy. And what he did is using uh, automatic learning techniques. That's a work that inspired me to, for, to do what I'm going to tell now. This was very interesting. The problem is that he used a kind of automa uh, automata, which is a record uh, registry automata, which is much difficult to learn. It's not, uh, it doesn't guarantee that what we learn is correct, and it couldn't be escalated into practice. So it couldn't, it could just learn small policies from the simulator, but nothing from hardware. So with this study about what people try to do, we did uh, what we could, what we could do, and that's what we have done, and that's what I'm going to tell now. The first thing I saw clear is that I needed an interface. A hardware interface to talk to the cache. As I said, the cache is transparent. It's just uh, execution time. There's a lot of nodes. We don't run alone. So I wanted an interface to which I could introduce a sequence of blocks like this and obtain the, the, the sequence of hits and misses in a deterministic way that it could replicate that. And I didn't have to worry for the frequency to which it was running the CPU, if there was another process, if the, the code that was generated interfered with something. That's uh, that's a hardware interface. Uh, a lot of problems that I will explain afterwards. Then I defined an abstraction. I'm not going to enter into this now. But the problem is that if we try to directly learn hardware, it's too complicated. So here we added a small layer that we abstract from this mealy uh, automata that I mentioned before. It's something which is more abstract, but contains the same essence and the same logic. And it's easier to learn. Then we're going to focus on that part. You connect to that part uh, an automatic learning algorithm. The idea of automata learning algorithm is that uh, based on inputs and outputs, we can build, uh, we can infer what the, the status machine of, this, of, the, of the equipment that we are uh, act to, uh, acting with. Depending on the automata, we can do it with some guarantees. Even if it's, uh, when if it's a black box, you cannot even be sure what, about the fact that the, what you have learned is true. But there are some conditions here that can give us some guarantees of, of validity, guarantees. If this works, this algorithm will give us an automata, which is a, a precise model of what the replacement policy does. The problem here is that you have an automata with 100 and something states, you wouldn't understand anything. So the last step was, OK, let's go to use something that's even faster, which is, which is more complicated, which is program synthesis. And we will put a template like um, like a ha, like a semicode of a representation policy, but we're going to leave a lot of gaps without defining. So we're going to pass the template. We're going to pass the automata, and we will make it fill the gaps of this program so that the program that you get behaves as this automata. So if it finds a solution, we will find a pseudocode that's equivalent to the automata. 
Uh, so even if we are not able to read an automata of, with 100 text, we all know how to read an uh, interactive language. This will be the pipeline that, that I implemented. I'm going to enter in details. This is more or less the comparison. The hardware interface is a tool called Cache Query. Everything that I've done is published. I will send the links afterwards. And as I said, we're going to try to abstract to the for the user all the details uh, that belong to the lowest level, let's say. So those details are the selection of addresses, the time, cache filtering, uh, the code that is executed, a lot of things. And Cache Query will uh, do uh, through a kernel is to accept block sequences. Blocks are identifiers that can have a, a question mark. In those case, those blocks, please mis measure the uh, the axis. It can have exp exp exclamation mark, so that means to invalidate that part from the uh, from the cache, which is a shield flash instruction. And then we just put the block, and that means that we access. It's an abstraction, and just to make an idea. There are some macros that can um, make uh, manual requests. I'm going to explain it very quickly. Imagine that you have an assemble of associative for um, with cache query. We would, uh, we're going to talk to the set 24 of the level one of the cache. And we're going to pass this input. Cache query will uh, expand that uh, add to a sequence of of different blocks like like associates for it would be to a b c d and this will fill the cache initially its request starts with an empty cache then we will access to another block which is called x it is a random block which is different from the previous one and x if there's only capability for for four blocks it will destroy something else and this uh, low dash question mark will expand it to uh, these brackets and what the brackets say for each block within brackets will say a different request with the prefix that I had before. So in this case, when for its for request, and we ask, and we will give access to A, B, C, D, X, and and we will measure if A is still in cache, and then we'll skip, and we'll get here is a miss for A, H hit for B, hit for C and miss for D. What have we learned with this simple request? Uh, that when we access A, B, C, D, X destroys first block A, the one we access first. So this is giving us some information about the replacement policy. I don't know how I'm about time. I'm going to skip the demo. If there's time at the end. Um, it's just interface. Here I specify the the level of the hierarchy this, the, of the set, I run commands, and we see the output, of which are the hits or the misses. Those cast queries, we can forget about hardware. We have solved a problem. We are going to see what's uh, what's Polka, the abstraction that I mentioned before. So why don't we try to learn from the cache directly from the hardware? The response, the answer is that we can, but it's quite inefficient. And the reason is that if we do this directly, the automata that we extract will have many redundancies and will, uh, we, will be difficult to learn. The reason is that replacement policies are completely agnostic to the specific content of the cache. As I said, it, they use metadata from the blocks. And that means that if we, if we have A, B, and C, the replacement policy is only interested in A if A is older than C. But I don't care if A, B, C, C, it doesn't care if it's C, D, E instead. The specific content of the cache is, is not important for the replacement policy. If we go back to the first example that said that the automata states were represented the content plus uh, the control bits, we were interested in an automata that only had these uh, control bits that we could ignore um, all about the content because the content is just the logic that we said at first of comparing tags and see if something is similar to the other. How can we solve that? What I tried to, de to do is to extract the replacement policy from an automata that only represented the replacement policy of this automata for that what I call the cache content management. Here you will see it clearer. Here we have the automata that I showed before. I will call it concrete automaton because it has a very easy language 
which is uh, entry sequence blocks or hits or misses, and that's it. So the abstraction that I built works the following way. Instead of a sequence of blocks, what we will have is associativity H, and H and the number which is next to H just means it access in the position zero or one or whatever from the lines of the cache will access up to a specific one, but we're specifying which uh, is the content there. Then we would add some other specific symbol, which is this M that means load something, or excuse me, destroy something. And, and all the entrants for H will be just load dash. It's the same for all of them, but M, what it will produce as an output is the index of the block that we are destroying. Abstraction just maps sequences of these of these abstract entrants to sequences like this specific entry. With the specific output, we will map them to unspecific uh, abstract uh, output. The idea for this is just to take uh, to count what's in the cache. If we start with a cache for which we know the initial content, maybe a, a cache which has A and B, H0, the, you know that H0 does something. H1, we know that in position one, we have B. We, we output B and now B, and now an M, and a random block, which is not A or B, that is not in the cache. That will cause a replacement. And what happens here? Now M must return us which of the previous block has been loaded. How do we do that? We need to issue two specific requests with the different blocks that we had before in the cache to see which of them produces a miss, in this case A, and return it. This abstraction, this mapper, has an overhead, which is uh, that every time we have an M entry, we're going to need several requests, sp specific requests. But as I'm going to show in the next slide, this overhead is, uh, is reasonable to pay. To see an example, we have a, a cache, a certificate to cache with a LRU policy. The automaton here is from the, uh, the specific, uh, each, there are 12 states, and all those controlled bits. And if we use our instruction, that's the automaton that we learn. If we think about the LRU policy with associativity 2 that we need, we need a state in which the oldest block is the first one and a state in which the oldest block is the second one. With two states for that automaton, we don't need anything else. As you notice here, there are a lot of symmetries in this automaton that are being uh, destroyed. It's like seeing this same automaton one over and over again. With this automaton, we will pay a cost for the mapping, but we will save a lot more because the reduction in the number of states is, is exponential. We have a hardware interface. We have this abstraction. We will see what's uh, this automaton learning. The idea comes from the 80s, and that's the uh, name of the speech. Automaton theory is an, is an old discipline, but what I found that was quite interesting for me is a paper from, by Dana Andwin from the 80s, which proposed an algorithm called STAR. The STAR, L STAR, which gave us an efficient algorithm to learn regular la languages. I think, I don't know if you explain, remember, but uh, learning regular languages is like learning uh, a deterministic automaton. So, what's the look of this algorithm? I'm not going to get into it. I'm just about to finish the, the difficult part. Dan Andrin, what Dan Anglin was uh, a protocol called student professor. In this protocol, the professor knows everything. It has magic powers. It's an oracle and knows what we want to learn. In, and the student, we will allow him to, to, to kind of question belonging of membership questions. I have a word. Does this word belong to this language? And to that, the answer from the teacher will be yes or no. This is easy to implement because if we have a, a system with which we can interact, just give him the output and we will obtain an, uh, we, the input and we will obtain an output. Also, there are equivalence questions when the student has an hypothesis. I think that the, the language we're looking for and the, the professor will say yes, 
uh, the, the algorithm finishes. And in case it's not the case, it has to give it a counterexample to refine the learning. Obviously, to implement a, an equivalence query, we will need some specification on Oracle that tell us what the hell is the hardware doing. We will see how to solve that. The only thing that you have to keep in mind is that there's an, an efficient algorithm that allows us to learn or infer the, the minimum automaton with a polynomic, polynomic cost in number of questions. And the cost depends on the number of states of the automaton. That's very important. That's why it's very important to open a small automaton because the smaller it is, the less questions we will need. That's uh, more or less uh, the that's common sense, I guess. So here, I skip some slides in which I I were with details about uh, this algorithm. With the version that I will publish, you will see it afterwards. But in practice, I didn't need to 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 learn about this. I know this language which is automaton, so we'll take a library in this case, which is LearnLib, which implements the star and, and a lot of extensions, and especially L star has an extension for milli machines. So, a uh, uh, pertains uh, questions. Were, were said just no, with an Amelia machine, we will obtain an output. Equivalence questions are more complicated because we have to, to it's hardware, it's a black box, we cannot know what we are learning is really what's inside. So what we're going to do is to get it closer by, by circling around with tests. Imagine you have a model and you have the hardware. We're going to start generating inputs randomly. We throw them both, and the more inputs we have with no contradictions, m the, the higher chance uh, our trust in the model will be higher. The, this pro this causes a problem. You can spend 10,000 hours, and the more you spend, the safer you are with regards to the, your model is being correct, but this is not telling too much. So instead of this, we decided uh, to use conformance testing. And what conformance testing does, especially uh, for a method which is called WP, that is that we assume that the hardware that we're implementing has a maximum uh, and, and, and a, fin a limited number of states. There are machines that, well, there may be machines with infinite number of states, but in hardware, the, the number of states will be limited, will be finite. This gives us a limited sequence of tests, so if we pass them, it ensures equivalence. Therefore, if we're able to generate that sequence of the test and pass it, we, are, we have guarantees that our Im automaton implements the same as the hardware. So we can deduce that the hardware has a limited number of states. In practice, that's more complicated because the number of sequence cr uh, grows in exponentially, so you can never do it. But if we get the argument and turn it around, it let us say that, and this is a, a stronger guarantee than just testing and testing for two hours, 10,000 of queries, is the following. If I learn an automaton that has 2,000 states, the hardware will be equivalent as long as the hardware has less than 2,200 states. If we assume that the hardware has a finite size, that's correct. And it's very difficult to achieve when you are learning something for black box. You are not sure about uh, being correct. So we basically have our algorithm here where we connect our interface. And it's going to start uh, making input and output question, and it will generate an automaton that implements the replacement uh, policy with guarantee that it is correct. What happens? Well, I've mentioned earlier on, this is the way the, an automaton looks for a cache of uh, associativity for and for this uh, LRU policy, which is quite simple. So if somebody is able to tell me here that this is implemented the LRU, then that would be quite not worthy. So what can we do to automate here? The expansion of some explanation of what this automaton is doing. We will try to apply common sense or the intuition we have, which is the intuition that I have when I think about a replacement policy. 
and I'm going to try to code it in a system in some way. So this is my intuition. I was saying that each block has certain control bits, this metadata, and then the replacement policy will have a promotion rule. When you access a block, you update those control bits. So there's a replacement policy that tells us when we load a block, we load, we choose which one we load based on this uh, blocks and an insertion rule when we insert a new block, which is the control value. And then a normalization rule, which is a bit special, but it's very simple if we give you an example. There is a policy called uh, MRU, where each block has an extra bit, which basically inserts zero, and each time you access the block, it, it goes up one. So the replacement policy says look for the first block that uh, has one zero and replace it. And what happens? At some point we can have all blocks with the bit to one and we wouldn't be replacing anything. So the hardware needs to normalize that state and when all bits are in one then we go down to one. We take them down to one and that way we continue replacing blocks. So how do we do this in practice? With a template which is as follows. We define a hit function, a miss function, and these functions are, correspond quite a lot to the transitions of our automaton. So the state is simply an associativity control, which can be sort of full numbers, or, and it will receive the index of the line we're accessing, and then we will choose a new state uh, with the promotion rule of the old state. We normalize it if needed, and we return. And the template for the miss, we define the state, we normalize if needed, we choose which uh, line we destroy using the replacement rule, we uh, use this uh, insert with the insertion line, and then we normalize and we return the state and the index. So what's missing? We have to design more specifically these functions, these rules. So the promotion rule, this is the way it looks. And what's interesting here is that this is a code that all of you can understand, and the only new stuff are these uh, question marks. These are the gaps that I've mentioned earlier on, and this is what the tool will try to fill in. So in this if, I wanted to generate uh, an expression, an arbitrary one, and I can give it a length of recursivity limit. Uh, if a condition is met, update, this position with a value that I don't specify. And this natural expression can be add a constant, add the value that we show here to notify whatever. And then we're going to define a loop and the same if an arbitrary condition, a Boolean condition is going, we're going to depend on two variables and we update again with an ar arbitrary expression. So what's left? We have to encode the automaton's output and transition functions as constraint. Each transition is an input to the hit uh, function and an output. And if we write all of the inputs and output, we can send that to the mm, to the tool, and if it finds a solution, it will try to generate code here, expressions to generate a program that behaves exactly like our automaton. And that it has a structure here where we can go directly to see which is the uh, expression, and that allows us to extract the promotion rule. Okay, this is all great in theory. Uh, Automate, automate on learning, but this probably doesn't work, does it? But perhaps it does, and that's what's great about this. I've done three assessments. The first one, seeing how good is our algorithm for automaton learning. We're going to simulate some um, replacement policies, and let's see how our algorithm escalates and what it looks like. And the advantage of simulation is that we start training with things from which we know the solution. If I implement the uh, 
the replacement policy PLROU. I know the number of states it can have, and when I generate the automaton, looking at the number of states, we can be certain that what we have learned is correct. And if this works, just by changing the simulator and, and, and connecting it with our interface cache Goofy, it, if it works, there are some additional complications that I will mention, but that's it. And finally, we will take all of the uh, uh, automaton that we have learned from simulators and harbors, and we're going to use it with our templates and see if we can really learn something. And these are the results of the simulated caches. Uh, these are the replacement policies, and these are the different associativities. And if you remember the prior articles that I mentioned, permutation policies, only the first three, only these three ones could learn. This, uh, this is end of master thesis that use the more complex one, are able to learn a MRU to associativity five in 30 hours, but we do that in less than one second. And, and this is because of these fractions, which may seem not so important, but it's adds quite a lot of escalation. And these are more three more complex uh, uh, policies that we have reached only this level of associativity in the time of time. But we are doing a lot more than had been achieved in the past. Uh, so it's quite a considerable achievement. There is still a challenge because the learning time uh, grows exponentially with uh, associativity. So for very large caches, it's going to be very difficult. But let's see how it um, acts compared to hardware. I had three machines, and I core fourth generation, sixth generation, and eighth generation with three different levels of caches each. And what are the problems? Well, plenty of them. First, in level three, the bigger policies, not all sets implement the same policy policy. So to sort solve that, I focus more on some sets that are called leader sets. And you would think that the replacement policy is the same in all sets. But replacement policy tries to maximize the number of hits for all programs. But there isn't a perfect uh, policy replacement, replacement policy that behaves well for all cases. There are policies that uh, give advantage to programs with a certain uh, memory um, outload and some benefit others. And if we could implement both, and ideally, depending on the load that we're executing to execute one or the other, it would be great be because we would get the best of both world, worlds. Um, and this can be done in hardware. Uh, it takes a number of sets that are called leaders, and they are going to implement the policies and other po leader, policy A, and others are going to implement policy B. And these leaders are the peaks that I was uh, observing last year, and we're going to have a meter where we're going to count the hits and misses from each one of the policies, and the other sets that are not leaders, that are called followers, are going to implement both policies, but they are going to execute each time the one which is at that time is uh, mm, producing more hits. So if the policy is changing dy dynamically, it's very complex to learn. So we're going to fo co focus only on two lines. And even if we, we're going to focus only on two leaders. And, but even then, not all leaders are deterministic. And our uh, learning techniques only allow us to learn uh, deterministic policies. Uh, they are not pro um, turning to probabilistic. It's quite um, complex uh, so far. And then L3 has too large associativity. That's another problem. How can we solve that in the practice? In practice, because we've seen that for more complex policies, we can only reach six. So from six to 26, it's a long stretch. So we've had to cheat here. There is something that we call Intel Cat uh, Association Technology, and this was born so that when you're running your process in a computer. Depending on whether something else is being executed, you're going to have more or less interferences in the cache, and, and that's going to have an impact. But with Intel cache all allocation, you can define hardware policies so that a process or a core only use part of the cache lines. So you, you could tell it core A, which is only going to run a critical process, 
can use alone six of the 16 lines of the cachet, and the rest has to fight over the other six lines, the, the other 10 lines. So with this, we have virtually reduced associativity so that at pro our processes, when it's been executed, has only four lines. And there's another problem, but I'm going to leave that aside. And these are the results of uh, running this with hardware. We see that level one, all associativity eight, they all implement uh, PLRU. In level two, uh, free uh, Skylake before sixth generation, they also implement PLRU uh, level two. But uh, then in Skylake, they reduced uh, it to four lines and they implemented a new policy. Uh, uh, with 160 states, and this policy is not yet documented. In a level three, after the sixth generation, the leaders that implemented the deterministic policy are these ones, and the other ones that I had seen, the peaks, match exactly these figures, and they implement a different policy to a new one that has 175 states. So we have models in the shape of a automaton of the replacement policies that implement these two possibilities. And we can derive the explanations from this. Let's see if we can synthesize them. These are the seven programs that I simulated, the seven policies. This is, these are the two hardwood ones, and for all of them except for TL, uh, who we've been able to synthesize, and the reason why we've not been able to learn in TRU, TRU, PLRU. My replacement policy was that each line has an associated bit, so, uh, but this doesn't um, work in PLRU because it has a control, global control levels rather than one, two bits per, per line. It has certain bits that are shared by all of them. So the, because the explanation for PLRU does not match our template, we are not able to find a solution. But if we extended that, we could probably manage to. So what do this uh, policy, uh, replacement policy have? Uh, what do they look like, these replacement policies that have not been documented? I've forgotten, by the way, to mention that when we have an automaton and we have learned it, we know the states what, because we can distinguish them. Two states are different because for a certain input generate different observations, but there is no way to know which are the bits of this state. So part of the synthesis is going to request that to instance these bits. And in this case, we have uh, states that are a vector of four um, numbers, and the synthesis will give us the specific values for each state. And there's more than one solution for an automaton in some cases. And this is one of the solutions I found. So the promotion rule tells us that when you access a block, you introduce a hospice to one. And this loop over here is the normalization rule, which basically says while there, if there isn't, or as long as there isn't, the control bits in three increase one by one, all of the lines except for the one that we have just updated. And if we go to the miss, the miss index, this is the replacement uh, rule. It says we will iterate by vector the first element that has uh, this uh, control equal three. That's the one we destroy, and the, the next one will be inserted with eight one. And normalization says the same. While if uh, uh, no block equal to three, increase all blocks except for the one you have just inserted. And the level three one is very similar. It only changes the promotion rule. This is a bit more complex. And if you think about this arbitrary uh, expression, uh, this is synthesized here, a condition uh, with the if and uh, else. Uh, it could be more complex. So if bit is over one, 
say one, and if not, zero. So normalization is the same, but now we're going to inc increase all of them, including the last one that we have just updated. Um, and, and to the right-hand side, uh, everything is the same, except for increasing also the one that we have just um, updated. So to conclude, an end-to-end -end solution for learning the deterministic hardware replacement policies. We are able to automatically infer human readable descriptions. That's quite good. And we have uncovered two previously undocumented policies used in recent Intel processors, and that's quite nice. And this is interesting not only in terms of security, but there are people who need hardware simulators to assess. So knowing this means that we can implement a simulator that corresponds or matches the existing hardware. These are our cache queries. Uh, the interface Polka is the learning tool for Automaton. And if you want the core details, you have this uh, reference here. And I think that's all. I hope it wasn't too tough. We have time for questions. Just a brief question. None of these architectures has a segregation of the instructions cache and the data cache. Yes, level one in all of them. Uh, data and instructions are separated in level one. And cache query only works with data. We cannot learn the replacement uh, policy for the instruction part. We can implement it. It's more complex because then you have to do jumps, and it can't be done. And L2 and 3 are unified, so they have both. My guess is that the policy will not make a distinction uh, depending on whether you have data. But this is my intuition. So far, when I generate code, I make sure there's no interference, and I only look at the data. But it's a great question. And so far, I presume it's not going to have an impact. And another presumption I make, there are Intel patents that say that the L3 replacement policy can vary depending on whether the block is on level L1 or not. So the higher level uh, give a view of the lower levels. And so far, I cannot implement that because how do I generate the addresses? How Chris Query generates the addresses? Because automatically I uh, destroy what's in level one and level two. So I presume that is never going to happen. And to implement that case, I would need two cores and synchronize. It can be done, but it gets complex. So to answer, it could be that the policy is a lot more complex. And in fact, my bet is it is. Thanks for this talk and congratulations, particularly this part of where I've been able to follow, actually. Uh, this type of thing is sort of very specific for a very tiny group. I hope my questions make sense. One of the questions that I was thinking about at the beginning is, which is the reason why replacement policies are not documented? Why does Intel prefer not to document certain replacement policies when in other processors or in other catches it has been documented. Well, I don't know if they've said it. Intel used to say we implement pseudo uh, RLU, but uh, pseudo is uh, very vague. You can do it in many ways. The standard one is with a tree, and it seems to be what they did in hardware, but they tend to be quite vague when they say these things. We've, it's always been uh, sort of uh, defined through reverse engineering. Well, the reason, I guess, that's where, because of competition, yeah? But replacement policy right now is in almost all of them. Between this paper and one that was published simultaneously with, I can't remember the name, but they've been doing the same thing in a different way. And the replacement policies, I think it's more or less uh, sorted out. What's interesting now, and 
and the more critical component uh, and the in Intel, uh, according to the expert, is prefecture. Uh, it's probably not documented in some mystery, and it affects performance uh, quite a lot. So, I guess it would be the next thing to tackle. Another question to do with this: replacement policies that you have been able to deduce during all of this process. Are they clean policies? Uh, if you found an LRU, have you seen that um, it's a real uh, LRU, uh, or or have you found that it doesn't always behave in the same way? And if so, is there a logical explanation behind that? Could there be noise at the hardware level, or uh, or more sort of a more obscure implementation? There's always noise even at the kernel level in if you disable interruptions. The hardware always does strange things and it's difficult to know. But what I do at the end is to repeat a lot of times and sometimes you do see some non-determinism. Strange things we have found sometimes when the PC is empty rather than feeling um, left to right, it feels in right to left and that means that the trees, the, the typical PLRU trees look a bit strange. And something else we have found is that this is the catch query interface, okay? And it's great uh, to interact as a QEd. If I do this, I fill in the cache and I check. They're all there and then I see which one's missing. And it says uh, X has removed the zero here. So if you play this way, we notice something very strange and it's like a, it looks like a book in most Intel caches is not a critical one but these are details uh, where uh, we would presume certain stru structures generate certain things but if you look in it's not always the case so it's like a bug there but but there are things that look like bugs but have you found uh, some of them that has a, has a logical explanation because it's not a clean or standard replacement policy, but they're trying to implement some kind of uh, um, optimization or I have both examples. There is a hardware bug. I won't uh, talk about it yet, but in a few weeks we might publish. It has no security impact, but just in case. And the other one is that the new one and new two are very are inspired. They are uh, variations of these ones. These two policies were defined in an Intel paper a lot of years ago. And what we found in hardware are a variation of these two, which are Intel replacement policies. These two are theoretical. There was a paper that proposed them and said this improves performance compared to the prior ones. And when we look at this and we find these two automaton here, of course, at the beginning, the automaton would know what it does. But when we compare the explanation of what's in the hardware and what Intel had proposed in its paper, it's like the same family of policies, but it is a variation. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, we have no time for more questions because the other uh, rooms are also finishing. Thanks very much, Pepe, and please, applause.